Hey there gamers, I'm Pruitt and this is Jim Davis. Give us your hands, give us your hearts, and I hope you're ready because there is only one direction, one world, one nation. It's one shots on WebDM. Now give me fried chicken. I only got one shot at this. Oh God. Yeah, I know, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. So one shots, you ain't got time for a campaign. No. You ain't even got time for like a short, like you go like, oh, three or four, ep no, no, no. One go, mm -hmm. all the marbles or dice. Sure, uh, you know, a, a game that you play in one sitting. Uh, there's no expectation of a continuation after it. It's, mm -hmm. it's a self-contained thing. Maybe this is something that you're playing at a convention or a type of game that you're, you know, you're participating in to, to showcase a system. It's like, hey, I, I bought a new game. Let's play a, a one shot of it to, uh, to try it out. But there's others. There's things like new player sessions where, uh, you know, it's like, I, I've never played this game before. I've never, you know, never played D&D. &D. Well, why don't you come on over to the group this week? Yeah. And, or then there's those rare times or maybe not so rare times where <laughs> you know you have a, a no show at your regular group uh, a bunch of people have to call in you know they're not there and you don't want to run the regular game so you do a, a fill in one shot for the people who are there play around maybe someone else DMs who you know doesn't normally DM or yeah. something like that the big question there is like who cares like what what are, why does it matter what different kinds of one shots there are uh, why is this not like just any other game that you would prepare right yeah. and, and I think that the answer to that is that depending on what kind of one shot you're playing and the purpose of it. Why are you doing this? What are you, why are you playing this game? That's different than we're gonna to get together every week indefinitely to play out this game that's an unfolding narrative of, of our yeah. adventures, et cetera. Like, it doesn't need a point other than we want to do it. Right, right, right. but there are some considerations that should be taken into effect, right? Absolutely, yeah, and, and you know, the more you understand about why you're running the one shot, then you understand the kinds of things you need to do for prep, the kinds of techniques you might wanna use for the, the game, and you're able to tailor the experience um, because there are techniques that you might not use in a, in a regular game that are appropriate for a one shot. Mm -hmm. let's, let's move on to the, the, the core elements of these, these different types of one shots. Mm, yeah, so I'm thinking like the big things to consider are both our system considerations and then like setting slash lore considerations. Mm -hmm. And so like let's take for instance you've got uh, you're running a convention game and you know this is a Dungeons and Dragons game and you know someone's either signed up to, to be there or they've you know they've bought a ticket or it's just kind of like you know whoever shows up uh, gets to play. Consider the three pillars of play for Dungeons and Dragons and what you're gonna have set up that that highlights each of those three pillars of play and gives the different character classes that are going to participate in this one shot, a chance to shine, uh, something like that. This is one of those that I, I notice a lot where usually in a one shot, whatever one the DM sort of favors gets the most attention. And, mm -hmm. and you, those are the ones where it's like, oh, we played a one shot of D&D, &D, we didn't roll a single die. And it's like, that was mostly probably role playing and exploration, but there's an ignore, there, you know, there's a pillar there that is a part of the D&D &D experience. Uh, yeah. So things like that, if it's another type of system, is, is there something that you can showcase about the rule set and its uniqueness? If we're talking a game like uh, Call of Cthulhu, and that might be uh, the slow descent into madness, or in the case of a one shot, the rapid descent yes, into that's, madness. Yeah, that's, that's gonna be a trap door to madness. <laughs> uh, you know, Warhammer is a, a similar kind of thing, maybe the insanity points and the corruption and, and sort of the influence Influence of chaos and the, the the warping influence of it, but whatever it is about the system, whatever unique part of it that is, if it's if it's a, a game that has unique mechanics, maybe making sure that you understand those and, and you highlight them as part of that. And then there's also like things to consider about the character abilities. Do you know what characters you're gonna have in the party beforehand, mm -hmm. or is it just a you know big question mark till everybody shows up? Something as simple as you know you know that the people in the party are gonna play a lot of warrior types, then you might wanna tailor that experience to a bunch of warrior type uh, characters and have fights and, and an opportunity for them to think tactically and you know not just that but feature that heavily. Yeah, you don't want to just have a bunch of court intrigue, right? <laughs> you don't. Know, and I, you know, I, and this is back goes back to like the three pillars of play sort of thing uh, of D and D. And while it's specific to fifth edition, it, it, it can be applied uh, to, to many other RPGs. I enjoy the we didn't roll a die at all uh, last night type of sessions. You, very often. There's information, secrets that are learned, lots of uh, satisfying interactions and sort of role playing and, and figure things out. But 
I, for me, Dungeons and Dragons is a very specific experience. It's a little bit of that, a little bit of delving into places that are mysterious and, and discovering wondrous things, and a little bit of, of combat and action. If a one shot of D&D doesn't have a little bit of all three of those, then in my mind, I'm like, I might have had a fun time. It might be enjoyable and, and I, I'm, I, you know, I'm not disappointed, but I'm, I might not be satisfied because I didn't play Dungeons and Dragons with its pillars of play. If, if, yeah. I, if I showed it with a barbarian and uh, it's it, all cord and tree. You didn't get to rage once? <laughs> yeah. That might make you a little mad. It might. It made me <laughs> a little frustrated because I was, th I, at the very least, I could have played a different character that, that fit that scenario better. Or the, the, the person running it could have communicated better the type of game that they were wanting to, uh, to mm -hmm. play. And so that's why it's important to sort of, what, 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 why are you running this? Who's it for? Who's the, who are the players? Uh, what's the setting that you're going to be playing it in? Mm -hmm. Maybe there's an iconic monster or some key element of the setting that you're uh, that you're using that you want to highlight for this one shot. Particularly if this is a, a system showcase kind of one shot, you're like, okay, you know, we're all going to try out this brand new game. We're going to, you know, use these unique elements from the, uh, the system, but, but we're also going to like take a key sort of iconic figure and build an adventure around that. So you're getting the best of both worlds, the uniqueness of the lore and the uniqueness of the system at the same time. And like, if you're only going to ever play like one game <laughs> of a system, then why not play the most iconic uh, sort of game you can play in that system? Right. And so being familiar enough with the lore uh, uh, of the setting that you're using, picking out the elements that are iconic in it to feature in your game might be something that you consider. And then how can those be translated into key NPCs, which you will then portray and, and we'll get to you know, the running, actual running of these things here in a minute. But this is where you lay the foundation for that and, and your consideration for what you need. Oh yeah, because you know, showing off that system, you want to show off the system. You sure. want to show off every aspect of yeah. it. You don't want to just like focus in on this or that. That kind of happened. Uh, what was that uh, Rune Quest? Where oh yeah yeah. Uh -huh. where we we did a one shot of Rune Quest, <laughs> and then we diplomanced our way out of everything and did not show off the combat system. No, at and all. we were all and we were all three or four of us like pretty. You know, we were combat. We were combat competent. I, uh, I was I was right. combat heavy. I was the leader, the fucking bison rider, and all that. So we came back and did another one shot. Right. Yeah, yeah. And then we showed that off to rousing applause. Sure. Yeah, I yeah, mean, yeah. that was some epic <laughs> fighting. Uh, I have to say, I want to go. I want to play. I'm, what I'm saying, Jim, is I want to play Rune Quest. Again. I, you know, we, yeah. Well, uh, Rune Quest is a very fun game. Uh, if I can invoke that charm <laughs> sure. or whatever. Um, uh, but that was an example, right? Like those were two uh, one shots, even though we had the same characters, they weren't, the story was not connected. The, we didn't always have even the same players between the two uh, groups. And, and it's there for like, hey, come, you, you're interested in RuneQuest? Come watch a game of it yeah. uh, and, and see how the mechanics work of it. Um, and it's similar if you were at like a convention or something like that and, and sort of showcasing something. Or even if you're just around your table uh, and it's just at home, and you're like, hey, yeah. I got this game, let's play it. Hey guys, let's play City of Mist. So let's move on to that preparation. You're taking these elements into consideration, and you're preparing your one shot. Yes. Where do you start, Jim Davis? I think, really, honestly, the first place I start is whether or not I'm going to prepare pre-gens for the game. Yeah, and that, that does make it a little easier, doesn't it? I, I've been a part of a lot of one-shots as a player where the Dungeon Master seems to want to run the, the one-shot session as if it's just a regular-ass game of their home game. Like, we're going to make characters during the one-shot. If Unless the point of showing up to play is to learn to make characters and then play, or character creation takes all of, like, five minutes, then it's really kind of frustrating, and I would much rather just be handed a full Folder of, of, of pre-gens or allow or been given character creation guidelines ahead of time in order to have a character ready for play that, that fits that one shot. Yeah. And so pre-gens for me are, are, are one of those things where I might just prepare, uh, I usually prefer at least two for every potential player, if not more, because I want the players to have a choice. If I've just got five players, I don't want to prepare just five pre-gens. I, you know, I just don't want to have to deal with <laughs> with what happens when someone's like, oh, I want it. We both want the same one. Yeah, it's yeah. okay to have a have a have a couple that might overlap just a little bit, just sure. In case you get that two people that want to play the mage. Sure, know? sure, sure. It's, so it's like again, we're looking at something like a game like D and D. I might make a pre gen for every class. And, yeah. and make sure I, I try not to double up on uh, the any of the races that are there. And so you've got like 12 unique um, characters. Yeah. It can definitely speed things up. It can make things easier. You've made characters that are tailored for the scenario that you were playing. Maybe there's a little background information that's there. But you also want to give the players room to role play those characters, find their own voice, find what's unique about them and highlight that. So keep the background and personality and the like for your pre-gens loose. Yeah. Uh, and sometimes when I make pre-gens, they come with blank personalities, blank everything, and it's just like, here's an elven archer. Like, 
play that. Here's a Minotaur Barbarian, play that. And then it's up to the player entirely to select alignment and personality mm -hmm. traits and all that other kind of stuff. The other sort of consideration is what's, what sort of table accessories and game aids that you're gonna use. Um, mm -hmm. If you've got tiles, make sure that you've got them laid out ahead of time. You know the arrangement that they're gonna use. If it's a poster map or printout or something, uh, making sure that it's handy and if there needs to be something marked on it, it's already pre-marked. Basically, anything that you can do ahead of time that you would might otherwise do in a home game because you're just taking your time and you got six hours to play, yeah. uh, do that ahead of time. Prep those out. Put your miniatures that you might use or your tokens or your or pawns or you know, paper minis or whatever it is, uh, get them ready to go and have them, you know, easily at hand. Maybe you have uh, an extra set of dice on hand in case someone pl you're playing with doesn't have that, uh, you know, doesn't have a set of dice that they can use. Extra pens, pencils, character sheets, scratch paper, all sorts of things. Having them handy uh, is, is going to be important. Now, if this is your first pre-gen, you're going to convention, or sorry, first uh, one shot, and you're going to a convention or something, you might think that you require like a huge... <laughs> Uh, bag of <laughs> storage. Got a big tackle and, box full yeah. of all your shit. <laughs> right. yeah. I have heard that scrapbooking uh, storage containers are very are very good for dungeon masters on the go. They have a lot of compartments, a lot of containers. They're usually very portable. Maybe they have like the little carrying case and wheels. Mm -hmm. So like go to whatever craft store and just maybe look at those. I, I've not used them myself. Um, I, I use like a, a little messenger bag. Uh, but I, for people who use like terrain and lots of miniatures and, and things like that, uh, having a, a really sort of handy portable storage case can be um, can be helpful. Other considerations would be printing out rules. If you're uh, if you're sort of highlighting a new system and not everybody has access to the rule book, printing out or making available those sections that they're going to use. Uh, maybe even typing up a rule summary or preparing one to, to have for them, sharing it with them through like Google Docs or something mm -hmm. like that. But you know, making sure that they that the players have the tools they need to understand how the game works. Yeah, or maybe if you're uh, if you're going to be featuring like an environment that isn't normally played in, whether it be underwater or sure. like under dark, like going to right. have those rules ready. Yeah. For like movement, seeing in darkness, you know, invisibility, attacking from hit, that, those kinds of things, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. So that you're not pulling out the book at the convention, right? You know, and mm -hmm. you can kind of keep things moving because that's kind of that's one of the things with a one shot, like you're saying, well, it's preparation. But you want to keep things flowing. Yes. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Keeping things flowing is 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 the part of it, you know preparation is a key part of that because if you do have to stop and if you do have to interrupt yourself if it's like oh well, where is that rule oh I forgot it or it, either that or be comfortable just making the ruling on the spot and then going with it the difficulty there is that if you're playing with people you don't know and 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 you're sort of like having to establish trust very quickly with someone then sticking to rules as written is is a is a good baseline for that uh, because yeah. you never know if you're going to play with someone who, who, you know, rules as written is very important to them. Uh, avoiding that kind of argument uh, can be helpful. Yeah. The other thing to prepare ahead of time is if you do have some sort of like house rules that you like to use or, or, or you know, just uh, homebrew content that you like, uh, making that available for the uh, rest of the players and getting it to them as quickly as possible. Really the last thing for, for prep, and, and it's almost its own show in and of itself, is if you're using a module for your one shot, you're either running like a and d Adventurers League uh, game, you know, they're usually designed to be done between two and three hours, um, or maybe even, I think maybe like actually just two. <laughs> uh, but there's others, there's all kinds of scenarios and things that you might use to, uh, to run a one shot and obviously spending a lot of time preparing that module, figuring out what parts of it you're gonna use, what parts of it you aren't gonna use, how you're gonna run certain things, knowing it, making sure the monster stats are handy, a sheet that's easy to track their hit points or any special actions that they have, um, and, and, and keeping that uh, available. But we've got uh, earlier shows that we've, that we've done about prepping modules and sort of like preparing them for play. Uh, those might be uh, helpful for you and if you're running a module for your, uh, for your one shot. Also, I mean, something to consider mm -hmm. when you're when you're preparing is the structure, sure, mm -hmm. of the adventure. Yeah, yeah. right. Uh, one thing I like, I, I try to think about, is just like a three act play. Yeah. You have your introduction of characters and the introduction of the problem in the first act, uh -huh, uh -huh. and then they move on to the second act where they start exploring mm -hmm. and they hit their first setback or red herring. Sure. And then the final act, you find the thing, you overcome, and then you have resolution. Yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah. And, you know, some people, you might think of that as like railroading, but it's not really railroading. It's just more of setting out all the pieces of your adventure. Yeah. So that, you know, they're obviously going to have something happen. 
whether it's something gets attacked, something you know, mm -hmm. something gets stolen, somebody asks you to go get something. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. So I mean, particularly if you're just thinking of like hitting certain beats or or like yeah. this is the information that they're that I want them to have this hour. Yeah. And then this is the information I'd like for them to have this hour, and and yeah. setting up a situation that then has its own resolution that you're not you know you're prepared to accept whatever it is, and then you just have some options available for what might happen after that. Yeah. And because your 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 range of choices is smaller than a you know home game, it's easier to prepare for those, all those different sorts of outcomes. Yeah, thinking in terms of that three act structure can be helpful because a lot of one shots take place in a in a short amount of time between mm -hmm. two and four hours usually. Mm -hmm. um, particularly if it's a convention game with a tight schedule and and you know you, if you're at your table longer than uh, than your time slot, then now you're holding up other people or something mm -hmm. or. Uh, or if it's like uh, you know for broadcast or, or something that you're showing to others, you might have a, a time constraints there that uh, you really want to abide by. And yeah. thinking in terms of those three acts can be helpful. Yeah. But consider this: right. new player shows up, never played uh, a, a role playing game before. They've they've heard about this uh, you know from whatever you know online somewhere, and they want to give it a shot. They know that their friends play. Um, you know, it, you might not just like say brutally kill their character. Yeah, uh, you just don't want to put them through the meat grinder at first, in, unless you know that like that's their thing, right? Like unless you right. know that like they love Dark Souls and other sorts of like uh, or something like that, you know, ch to be challenged and, and presented with uh, challenging problems. But you might not, right? Like you might just say like, "Hey, I'm I'm going to go like maybe extra hard on another player or an NPC to show them that the world is dangerous and deadly, but ne not necessarily them because you want them to enjoy the experience enough that they come back." And after a while, maybe you you know you drop the hammer on them, but yeah, you'll, you'll kill them next week. <laughs> sure, but there are a lot of people who's like the first time they play, it's a you know it's a disaster. Their characters die, or or you know they're <laughs> you well, know, I they mean, can't do anything. Right. Uh, you, yeah. Your new player shows up for a three-hour session, and they die in the first forty-five minutes, and then they spend the next thirty minutes making a new character. Right. Or, I mean, like that's not how you. Want that, we, them. we hope we hope a new player uh, can make I'm a character being, in thirty yeah, minutes. I'm being, I'm being very generous with that. With that. <laughs> time estimate yeah but that's not how you really want them to have their first experience sure I sure, mean, sure. I would rather them have uh, they hit all three pillars and in the end they feel triumphant and it's yeah. like yeah I feel like a winner I want to come back and do this again so do it again and then over time they sort of like learn that the game is you know has a lot of uh, complexity to it and a lot of different ways to play and it they learn the reality sure. of the game. <laughs> yeah, yeah you come in uh, early uh, so consider that, right? If, if it's a if it's a convention game, or if it's like a, an organized play game, or something like that, and and there are time constraints that uh, that you have to abide by, those are obviously things that you want to keep paramount, and, and, and you want to know what time it is. How much time do I have left? How much time do I think this particular thing is going to keep? Uh, you know, is going to take? And so pacing becomes a big thing with one shots, and this is sort of one of those. Things like any time there's a big convention, that, like a big role-playing convention, you'll see people online complaining about how their game master like started the big fight 30 minutes before they were supposed to leave, mm -hmm. or there was this, there was a lot of dragging their feet uh, in the beginning because it wasn't obvious uh, what they were supposed to be doing and, and what their, you know, their, their purpose for play was. Yeah. Or there's a, just a big, just a big honking middle of it. <laughs> you know, the the beginning is you know clear. What do we do? We do this, and then the the middle is maybe because the the dungeon master or game master is used to running more traditional style games where they can take their time. They're like, oh, we'll do some random encounters, and maybe some things will happen along the way, and then that's mixed up with players wanting to go shopping. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of things like I will tell the player, no, you cannot. No, we're not doing shopping. No, if there's something on your character sheet that you think you should have that you do not have, then then it's probably okay to just write it down. But like, we're not going to do the thing where the players uh, retreat to their world and the books and, and, and look things up and, and then come back to the table when they see fit. Yeah. Um, not, not, for, not for me in a, in a one not shot. Not for a one shot. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, and so like those are the things that you need to think of as, as a DM. Like, you know, skip past those parts, get to the heart of it, right? Like what is it that the player who's, uh, you know, maybe stalling or, or, or wants to do something that would stall the game trying to accomplish? Is there a way you can just cut to the chase? Mm -hmm. Is there a way you can just say say yes and move on, or or just be like, no, I'm sorry, that's that's not going to happen. Uh, we're going to start. Some of that can be handled pre-game by letting them know, like, hey guys, when we 
when we start, we're going to, number one, have assumed you're all together. Uh, we have assumed you've said yes to the quest. Some DMs might be like, not only have you said yes to the quest, but we are at the quest location. Like, we're not even right. going to deal with the before. Yeah. The whole point is to play through this dungeon. We are starting at the dungeon. Yeah. And that's called uh, a, a hard scene framing uh, or, or just hard framing a scene. And um, a lot of times if you do it in, in the game, the players will be like, well, wait a sec, I wouldn't have done that. I wouldn't have just done that. You know, my character would have done this and that. And it's difficult in ongoing play because you want to give the players a chance to give input on what their characters would do. But in a one shot, just you just tell them, like, no, this is where we're starting. You guys already know each other. You guys are already used to working together. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, you guys have accepted this quest. Here is where it begins. Yeah. Boom. You're in front of the door. You don't know how to get in. And, yeah. and instead of starting them at the tavern and doing the thing and getting yeah, ready to leave, getting ready to leave, see if they get henchmen. Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, no, no. You already got the letter from the wizard. You're already here. Sure. Yeah. And maybe it's a thing where it's like y'all opened a letter and it teleported you to the to the thing. You're yeah. right. Yeah. Uh -huh. By those means, then it's like, well, sorry. I mean, you read the letter. <laughs> yeah. And you get to the fine print at the bottom, you will have already been at the location when you like, finish the sentence. Yeah. Shit! <laughs> By reading this letter, you have consented to a teleportation. Yeah. Uh, so, Ooh, that's, a, that's a fun idea. Uh, yeah, just a jerk wizard. <laughs> Uh, so some things to do consider when pacing. Consider yeah. cutting out the middle. Yeah. A, a strong opening, particularly an opening in which the players, you know, do have some time, right? Like, it doesn't need to be like, go, 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 go. Oh my God, we, we got to get done before we've even started. Like, you do have some time to breathe and you do mm -hmm. have some time to allow the players to get to know their characters, get to know each other, get to know how their characters might fit together. So maybe you do have sort of a start that's a bit slower. You do the more traditional, like you meet at the inn or on the road or whatever, or if you are like, hard framing a scene and, and like we're starting here, then you still give them a little time to catch their breath and get to know uh, one another. The The opposite of that would be starting in media rest and it's like the action starts now, we've pre-rolled initiative uh, and, and we're gonna begin. You know, you either have uh, really given them a lot of information ahead of time, this is why you're doing what you're doing, uh, or it's super clear what's going on as you set up the fight. You know, these uh, villains are attacking our, our, you know, our home and we have to drive them out in order to, you know, protect ourselves. Mm -hmm. And then once the immediate threat is gone, then you have the kind of, whew, all right, what was that? Where did they come from? How did they attack? Why are they going on? Can yeah. we chase them? How do we do it? That middle part where you're just sort of meandering around and you, and, and, and especially if you know you've got a big fight coming up, a showcase fight, there's a villain, there's a something. That's the thing you, you're wanting to show off, right? That's the thing you've put a lot of work into. That's the thing your players have shown up for, presumably, for, for that kind of uh, situation or the, the showdown, the, the climax of whatever adventure it is that you're, that you're playing. Um, like maybe get to that a little earlier than you expect. And, and I think some DMs maybe they feel like they can't rush things or they don't want to push players mm -hmm. uh, or they don't want to like really put their foot on the pedal of the game and, and, and really drive it forward. But this is a one shot. And, and a lot of the things that you might chafe against as a player when, when your DM does it in a normal game, like, hey, don't push us, we'll, we'll get there. Or yeah. don't make decisions for us. Uh, in a one shot, you can push against that a, a little bit and, 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 you know, ask leading questions. It sounded like you were doing this. I'm going to assume that that is what's happening. A lot of times things are stalled in an adventure and a session of play because no one, not the dungeon master, not the players has been like, this is what we are doing. There's been a lot yeah. of options presented. Yes. <laughs> yep. And everybody, then you move on to the next option, and uh -huh. then you talk about the next everybody option. Everybody has a new option who uh -huh. talks. They all want to contribute an idea or a thing. And, yeah, but and, a decision's never made. But the decision is never made. Mm -hmm. And so as the dungeon master in those moments, you, uh, you, you we're really going to have to be like, okay, guys, we, we cannot sit here and talk about options for 20 minutes. We've got to we, we present the one or two. Yeah. And this is maybe where you present the options available to the players. Okay, guys, you can either do this or that, you know, or, or you know, or, and, and then uh, maybe take some input from the players because yeah. we don't want to cut them out, right? We're not like yeah. the, the one shot is not the chance where the DM gets to have their tyrannical control that well, they want, well, yeah. you know. <laughs> but it, but if they're sitting there at uh, at a, at a T intersection in the dungeon, right. sitting there for 20 minutes going left right. or right. Which way did the clues tell us? Right. Can, you know, well, guess scout, what? Yeah. Throw a random encounter at him. Yeah, you can for, throw, you know, throw just, a little bit, just poke oh, him. Oh, you hear, you hear something coming from behind you, the way you came from. Yeah. It's getting closer. Yeah, and so those, those sorts of prompts, like you hear this, this, and what they are is a change in the environment. And that change means there's new information to process and, and now uh, you've moved closer towards needing to make a decision. Yeah. Some, sounds like someone's sneaking up on you. 
uh, you hear something from a particular direction or something like that. There's ominous uh, clouds, uh, you know, coming from somewhere. You know, just these little clues in the game that that let the players know, okay, um, it, you know, it's either time to make a decision or it's time to you know move forward. Yeah. Or you can also just say like, okay, guys, it's it's time to 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 move past this. Have we reached a consensus? Uh, and, and if it sounds like it has, then summarize. Okay, it sounds like this is what you guys want. Yep, 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 yep. All right, go. And then you can, you know, skip past a lot of the the filler stuff. You can skip past a lot of the uh, the things that are, are there in the game. They're they're part of the emergent play, right? Like finding the adventure location is very often a, a part of playing the game. Mm -hmm. Getting to the adventure and and sort of. Uh, you know, figuring out what's going on is part of that, but in a one shot you don't have time and so that's why you're taking these sort of shortcuts uh, for pacing. Another big one's player advancement. Mm -hmm. You know, play, getting, getting players invested in a one shot can be very difficult. A lot of DMs sort of like, they might not uh, care for that style of play because, uh, you know, they, they don't get the, the sort of rich character interactions that they get in their home game. Mm -hmm. But guess what? You can get deep character investment during a one shot and even between like total strangers. Uh, yes, <laughs> you can. That can happen. I'm sorry. At, 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 at the one you ran at Pax Unplugged mm -hmm. or Pax South this yeah. past year in San Antonio, yeah, I had so much fun, and we had like there were nine of y'all, nine people nine playing people. <laughs> in a very loud convention, yeah, uh, hallway, yeah, and everybody was totally invested, yeah, and we, you know. You started off with a great bit of action. Sure. Mm -hmm. Then we got to a thing. We found out, oh, we got to do this thing. There's some problems to solve, how yeah. to approach the situation. And then we got sure. to the place. Mm -hmm. We started doing the thing. Yeah. And then you threw some more, uh, you know, we were being chased. Mm -hmm. And we had to fight them off while we finished the thing. Yeah. I mean, it wasn't that complicated. Right. Everybody had their thing that they got to do. Mm -hmm. Uh, and you know, we all had a great time. We had, yeah, there was three action scenes, a yeah. couple of exploration scenes, a couple of role playing scenes, uh, and an opportunity for everybody to to at least. Uh, you know, highlight what it was that they were good at and, mm -hmm. and, and what their characters were. And, and, and at the same time, it was we ran it fast and loose. And in a lot of those games like that, personally, I, I'm very fast and loose with the rules and, and, and I'm very much a keep the game moving, you know, yes and or yes or roll the dice kind of situation. Yeah. So it's very important to me that, that the players who are playing in that game, in this case, 5th uh, edition D&D, felt like they had played a game of 5th edition D&D, so we had boom, 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 all three pillars, and that we were moving the spotlight around enough, okay, you're gonna do this. Now that's, it takes a lot to be able to do that in, in like three hours for mostly a group of people you've never played with. It, it takes practice to get there, but you will get there yeah. if it's important to you, and, and, you, and you get an opportunity to, uh, to do it a lot. So, um, asking leading well, questions yeah. is one of the things that I would do, and, and by, by leading questions, they are questions that the player cannot answer with a simple yes or no. Mm -hmm. They have to give more information. They have to tease it out. And if you ask leading questions that also tie in other characters, then mm -hmm. you can start to develop a, a kind of rapport and role play. Let me give you an example of this. You know, the, the quest involves a journey of some kind that you're not necessarily gonna play out, you're not gonna do whatever. Mm -hmm. So maybe you use questions that are like, all right guys, it takes a week of trekking through trackless wilderness and, and stinking swamps to get to the ancient reptile temple. Um, please tell me uh, either something that one of the other player characters uh, did that made you feel like they had your back. Tell me something uh, that you saw that is indicative of the threat you're about to face for your, uh, you know, for the party, or that exemplifies some feature of the terrain of some kind. Tell me about uh, your character's thoughts on, uh, you know, this piece of information that another one of the characters revealed. And by asking leading questions like that, you're asking them to sort of probe their character's thoughts. Maybe what is it that they like about it? Uh, w w why would they be invested in the scenario or the characters around them? You've given the player an opportunity to care about what's going on. You've given them an opportunity to dictate some fact about the setting and, mm -hmm. and the game that they're playing. And you've asked them to think, like, what is it What what is it that my traveling companion does that just annoys the crap out of me? Yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, what, what was there a moment on this journey that we escaped a challenge by the skin of our teeth and, and had a, a, you know, formed a bond over or something? And if it's a particularly interesting description or something and everybody seems impressed or, or it really brings people closer together, maybe it's a chance for, okay, everybody get inspiration uh, from that moment or, or mm -hmm. something. Uh, you can do the same once they're in the, the adventure environment. You know, once they've entered the dungeon, they've entered the haunted wizard's tower or whatever, you can ask them like, 
all right, you guys, this this dungeon is sandy and dry. The desert has, has seeped in through the cracks, and, and every now and then a, a stone from the wall has fallen through, and a great big pile of sand has, has spilled into it. Why don't you tell me what you see that lets you know this is an ancient tomb of the desert god and whatever. So maybe the players describe the faded hieroglyphics or something, or a nest of asps. Yeah. Uh, something like that. And, and you, again, you're giving them a chance to describe to everyone else something about the, the thing. You've, you've set the scene for them. You said, here's the kind of tone of what we're doing. But you've given them a chance to, uh, to do that. And that, I've had some success with that, both in, in one shots and, and in regular games, really increasing player investment. Oh, yeah. No, uh, one thing as a, as a longtime player, I look forward to one shots more than a, a long term campaign. But I, because I find that I am, whether it's more reckless or more heroic, but I find that I want to go that extra mile because I know that this is it. Yeah. There ain't yeah. no coming back from this. Right. So I might do like the most crazy heroic <laughs> thing possible because then you can walk away with an amazing story from a group of complete ran random strangers. Yeah. Because you could possibly like do this epic thing. Do this epic you know, thing and take you know, that risk. Lay, lay down your life yep. so that the rest of the party can get out after you set off the fucking lich's phylactery to explode. <laughs> you know, like, like no, I'll hold it together hold it until together. you yeah, get yeah, out yeah. of the uh, room. Yep. And you, then, no, you go. You go. Yeah. <laughs> Just get out. Just get out. Yeah. Uh, you know. Uh, <laughs> Today was a good day. The, the other thing to keep in mind as you're running your game is that an RPG runs on information. Your players are going to need information to to yep. make decisions, to figure out where it is that they need to go. And so in a, in a long-term sort of uh, ongoing game, you might tease that process out. Yeah. You might put mechanical barriers in place to getting some of that information because you, know, you want to present that and, and sort of present a more detailed, complex scenario. Mm -hmm. You might not have that kind of time in, in, in a, uh, a one-shot. And so mm -hmm. if there's information vital to the party's uh, success uh, or to help them make a decision, then just make sure it's ultra clear. You know, yeah. in, in the one I ran at, at PAX, I just was really clear, like, all right, guys, this hag has contacted you because, uh, you know, she's looking for her son, the body of her son, so that she can resurrect it. You got to go find that body, bring it to the place that it needs to be, and here's the scroll you will use to resurrect this guy. Right, right. And then it's a case of where is he? Where can we find him? We need a, we need something else to, to mm -hmm. you know, an object of, of, the, of this person's to call their spirit back. And, and then that, it, that's all very clear from the beginning. Yeah, and, yeah. and then the choice comes in how they approach that objective. Yeah. It's not a linear, you have to do it this way, but it is a, this is what we're doing. How you accomplish this, entirely up to you. Right, right. Uh, so you do stick at some of that open-endedness that uh, that's fun with RPGs. Or if you want to have some mechanics in there to highlight the game, you just maybe make the DCs a little bit lower, a little sure. bit easier to achieve, less less know? less likely to just like throw off the game completely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you're something. searching for the thing. Well, I rolled a twelve. Maybe the DC was fourteen, but it's okay to make the DC twelve for this one shot. Right. Okay, you find it. Move yeah, on, move yeah. on to the next. Step. If, if yeah, you if, you're gonna do, if you're gonna do that, or, or if if, if I, I think for me, if I would either like lower the DC or just have it be like the player just has to say I do it, I, I search, I do it, and then the, the success is automatic, or or at the very least, um, the role isn't to figure do they get information or not, it's to determine how much information they get. They will always get enough to act on, but they could get a lot more if they roll yeah. really well. Yeah, yeah. You know, things like oh, that. Oh, yeah. Uh, and, and one way of imparting information is is NPCs. And I think a one-shot, uh, you, you want to consider, uh, and this sort of uh, straddles the prep, uh, tech running, running the game kind of divide, is having a key NPC that is memorable, an NPC that the players can sort of bond with or, or uh, f play off of, uh, an NPC that might have the information that they need a, or aid or assistance of some kind. Um, and, and, and having that NPC be sort of larger than life, weird or, or eccentric of some kind. A, a, this is where like just a stupid, silly voice can be fun. Oh, yes. Uh, and, and a great example of this is, is Emma's uh, use of grease meat on the Escape from Flavortown one shot that she did. Grease meat is a sentient lump of cheese and, and meatloaf that's been uh, achieved at sentience by being force fed through like a gamma centrifuge. I don't know, she'll have to ask her how it came about. But it grease me is a funny voice. The players are instantly uh, enamored mm -hmm. of this NPC. It can give them some kind of boon. It imparts some information to them. Uh, and and it, it creates an iconic moment in the game that it, it, you know no dice are being rolled. It's just the interactions of the people playing their characters. And, and this is where uh, you, you have a chance to deliver some of that information in a way that's iconic and, and really gets the point across and creates a memorable 
uh, memorable feel for your one shot. Um, so, I mean, there's a lot to keep in mind for these. Mm -hmm. uh, running a lot of them is is the trick to it, you know, like anything else. The doing it is the trick. Yeah, practice, yeah. practice, practice. Um, but we hope that uh, we've helped you kind of get an idea for what uh, what you might need in, as you prepare for your, uh, your one shots. Mm -hmm. Head on over to Patreon for our weekly podcast and so much more. WebDM is also on Twitch with three weekly games, which we upload to WebDM Plays, our second YouTube channel. Ready for a cue. Matthew folks. Davids writes, which left field creatures would Cynthia Fart. Let's brew it this time. Matthew Davis writes, which left <laughs> I actually got to the three. I'm good. I'm fine. <laughs>